little bit older, still not very old, so <laughs> still one of the younger scientists, but it's great to uh, give a presentation of the work that we've done in the past four years. And being a resident in neurology, I also have the opportunity to see these patients, and that's different from four years ago, and I just only heard your stories and read the articles, but now I'm also involved in the day-to-day -day clinical part of the periodic paralysis and non-stroke myotonia, so we would like to share some information on the studies. I thought that yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Thomas also already mentioned uh, the location of the Netherlands, quite small in Europe, and we're very famous for our windmills, cheese, cows. Um, but in the Netherlands, where I'm from, in the Nijmegen uh, area close to the German border, we don't have these windmills. We have some cows, we have some nice cheese, but <laughs> we're actually more famous because we're the oldest city was founded by the Romans. At least that's what we say, and I believe that's true. But then there's also Maastricht, and they stay the same, so we're in the middle of the struggle with some other countries or some other cities in the uh, Netherlands. Uh, this is a joke that my colleagues made me do, but Steve Cannon was already mentioning this yesterday during dinner. That there's this joke about the canals and the channels in Amsterdam, and of course it's very nice, but I'm more interested in the channel of the channels. <laughs> so bear with me on these other channels. Uh, this is a nice picture of uh, Dimitri Coleman, who's at uh, London. It's showing a picture of epilepsy, migraine, neuromuscular disorders, uh, nerve disorders, and uh, my message here is that these are all channel opathies, so it's all rare. Uh, but you also have colleagues in the brain field, uh, patients with migraine and epilepsy and in the nerve field, so you're not alone. Uh, but I'm too going to focus on myotonia and periodic paralysis. And we've heard this story uh, during the day um, that these channelopathies occur due to this disturbance of your electrical signal around your plasma membrane that surrounds these uh, muscle fibers. And the problem is in this fast exchange of the ions through the ion channels, more or less like a battery, so we use the same language, it's nice to know we're on the same line. And if you then zoom in on the uh, actual sarcolemma membrane, again, more or less the same picture as uh, presented before me, if you have this dysfunction in your sodium or chloride channel, you get myotonia, and if the problem is at uh, the calcium level, or again, the sodium channel, or the potassium channel, you get this paralysis. And um, also, this contraction part of uh, the muscle is uh, involved, causing the paralysis. Um, but I wanted to show you these slides because I like this physiology part a lot. But, um, I'm actually here more to talk about prevalence and clinical care of skeletal muscle channel of in the Netherlands. Some basic concepts of N of 1 trials. My PhD is on N of 1 trials. An uh, example of the individual end of one trials on the results of our combined end of one trials in myotonia. And I would like to give you some advice if you're interested in end of one trials. This is something you can really do yourself with some help of your physician to try and find if you can fine tune your own treatment. So it would be nice to end with some suggestions. Um, well, the difficulty with these uh, skeletal muscle channelopathies, that's what SMC stands for. That is the non trophic myotonia and the periodic paralysis is, of course, it's such a wide range of clinical phenotypes. So you can have just muscle cramps or just some eyelid muscle myotonia to the more typical phenotype, uh, the one that Christoph showed us, but you can also have more contracture or even dystrophy. Uh, so that's, that makes it difficult to treat and diagnose. And this is one of my patients who collaborated in the trial with myotonia congenita, and you can really see the action uh, myotonia of the eyelid closure is very difficult in opening the eyes. Um, but also of the hand grip muscles. So, this is also the action myotonia, meaning that there's this um, elongated relaxation phase after voluntary contraction. And E2 has this strong warm up phenomenon that it takes a while to get rid of the stiffness. This is a, these are trial measurements where 
we ask patients to well, do this to see how the myotonia reacts. And the same is actually true for periodic paralysis. And you all know this better than I do probably, but this broad clinical spectrum of periodic paralysis makes it also very difficult to get the right diagnosis because you can have these really short attacks in hyperkalemic periodic paralysis with the myotonia, but you can also have the severe hyper PP attacks and cardiac arrhythmia and dysmorphia leading to Anderson Tavil syndrome. So it's difficult. And here on the uh, picture is another patient of mine with uh, hypo PP attacks. Um, and it took a while and a lot of doctors for him to get the right diagnosis. And now we're still suffering from yeah, difficulties treating him with Diamox. And, um, so I'm also happy to hear his stories from Tauro Industries and maybe the possibility to get that medicine uh, to the Netherlands because there are a lot of patients waiting for new drugs besides uh, the Diamox. Um, so what we did over the last couple of years is that we uh, tried to make rare disease expo centers in the Netherlands. And you can see the map of the Netherlands again. Um, our luck is that we are quite compact. We have 70 million inhabitants and uh, our care is, uh, well, it's organized in nine academic research centers that are seen here. Amsterdam is two. So if you're having a problem with that, or actually it's eight, so I'm having a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> but there are seven on the map and Amsterdam is two. Uh, you can see in the red, that's where we are too. Uh, there are three rare disease experts centers that do a lot of diagnostics um, and the uh, centers that holds this blue circle around the blue centers that do the DNA diagnostics. Uh, so it's quite a lot with four centers. Uh, and we ask these four DNA centers to um, give anonymized records of the patients that they found to have a mutation in these known genes. Uh, just to see how many of these genetically defined skeletal muscle channelopathy patients are there in the Netherlands. Uh, and the result is 413 patients from 240 pedigrees, as you can see here. And you can subdivide this into 300 non-dystrophic myotonia patients and 140 periodic paralysis patients. So these are the patients in the Netherlands that we are sure of are characterized and have this molecular diagnosis. Of course, there are a lot of problems with getting the real number of patients in the Netherlands with periodic paralysis or non-stop myotonia because you, you never know. Now you miss the patients that do not have a known gene mutation, but you also miss patients who are not interested in going to a doctor. And I hear the stories all the time of families who get around during Christmas and they say, oh yeah, this diagnosis, that's nice, but I'm definitely not going more. Aunt Peggy also have these complaints, but she's never seen a doctor. So this number is going up probably in the next couple of years. So if you uh, do the math with our numbers and the numbers of the UK, because uh, the group of Michael Hanna also did a similar study, um, well, they can make an educated guess about how many patients uh, there would be in the United States. And then if you go somewhere in between, because in the UK the number is relatively lower than in the Netherlands, but then you would come up in the United States of around 1,500 to 2,000. There was a number that I already heard before yesterday. And worldwide it would mean around 30,000 to 50,000. But of course, this is an educated guess, and we know that there are these founder effects of geographic locations that are more isolated, and they think that's the same that holds true for Netherlands because we have some really large families, so probably we have an overestimation of the uh, periodic paralysis and the other skeletal muscle generalities. But still, for a rare disease to be somewhere worldwide of 30,000 patients, it doesn't seem so rare to me, so that's a good thing. But of course, these genetically unidentified patients should also add up in the future and also the well, I call them here the non-showers, but of course it would be nice to see all patients in hospital. Um, so 75% is uh, non-strophic myotonia of our count, and 25% uh, has a periodic paralysis with the hypo-PP being far most uh, common disease. And this is in line with other countries and previous research. And just um, well, for the geneticists and just 
more probably for yourself. I, I listed this um, table with the most common uh, mutations that we have found in our Dutch uh, skeletal muscle channel level patients, and this is for the periodic paralysis, and then we see that the ARCH5 to H his mutation is um, well really most common, 60% of this 60 patients of this 119 patients. Uh, and next up is the ARCH1239 is uh, both calcium channel mutations. And for the uh, sodium channel mutations, you see there's more range, but especially for the hyper PP, we see a lot of MET1592 VEL uh, mutations. Um, so before I go on to N of 1 trials, I would like to take you uh, with me through the obstacles of treatment of rare diseases because there are a lot of obstacles and, and I'm not even talking about the problems that well, the people in the lab encounter with their animal models, but I'm more talking about what if you would have a nice drug target from the group level. There is still little incentive from the pharmaceutical industry because of reasons that I already mentioned before, but still we have the problem of small numbers and large heterogeneity, meaning that even within one family with the same limitations, there's a lot of variation between symptoms, and afterwards there's a lot of uh, problems that um, are being encountered with production and registration of these off label drugs, but even then, if you succeed, then you still have to uh, make sure that you solve these problems with the patient level because these groups' results are nice, of course, but they do not translate to you as an individual patient, or at least most of the time they don't. They encounter the side effects, coverage difficulties, and these clinical fluctuations that make it difficult for you to find out is this my disease severity that is changing or is it the drug that I'm using? So it's quite difficult. Um, and of course we have a solution, otherwise I won't be, wouldn't be standing here. We think that N of 1 trials in daily clinical practice could help. And the N of 1 trial is uh, suggested to be the holy grail of evidence-based medicine on an individual level, uh, because you want to have this causality at the individual level. And the ideal situation would be that you have patient X give him or her treatment X and then find an effect by objective measurements. Um, and what would you like to do is then take the USSN Enterprise and Captain B. Carr as its captain and ask to go back in time and take this patient X again, but then would give placebo or another treatment and then again look at the effect and take a look at the effect uh, measurement that you, uh, well, to, to see what the real effect is of this treatment. But of course, this is only science fiction, so what can you do? Well, you can do this in a one trial. So you can um, ask a patient to collaborate in this little trial just for you, where you take different treatment periods for, let's say, two weeks, one month and you blind the patient and the physician for the treatment that you want to investigate. So, for instance, diamond, you're a new hyper-BP patient with middle attacks, but you still want to know whether diamond is helping you or not. You could say, well, let's um, set up this end one trial for periods of four weeks, and as a physician or as a pharmacist, we give you placebo and diamond, and after well, four or six of the treatment periods, we analyze some data and we come back to you and say, well, this really works for you or not. So you would have some evidence at the individual level. And you should be blinded, or at least that's best as a physician and as a patient. So it's called a multi-cycle within patient randomized double blind crossover comparisons. Quite a lot of a drug and placebo, and it would be nice to have some standardized measure of effect. And this is actually an alternative of what we do every day as physicians. We say, yeah, will this help you? Well, probably a good question. It's hard to say. What do you think? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm going to go. And then after three months, you say, and did it work? And the patient will say, yeah, probably. I'm not sure. So we go on. Yeah, well, why not? Just maybe another three months. And, and the thing is that after three months, you probably as a patient just remember that days before your visit, so yeah, you can just hear about the, well, three or four days just before coming into the decision again. So it's, well, it's everyday clinical practice, of course, but it could be better, I guess. 
Uh, so for these NF1 trials, you have to have some conditions. So in order to every period be interchangeable, um, it should be stable, non-progressive diseases like in the beginning of periodic paralysis. It should have measurable symptoms like attacks. We talked about these protection levels continuously that would be perfect for NF1 trials. But Fortunately, we're not there yet, and um, the treatment should be symptomatic and not uh, curative. Because if there's a treatment that's curative and you give it in period one, then period two would also be great, and period three and four and five and six also. So it should not be curative and should be fast acting to make sure that the placebo period is not uh, gaining from the treatment that was given just before the placebo period. So these are conditions that actually. Um, well, in period of paralysis, you can definitely go for end of one trials. Indications, well, when should you do such an end of one trial if there's doubt about it? If you have side effects and you really want to know whether this is because of the drug or not, if there's about expensive treatment and you want to have a little bit more evidence on if it's really true that this has an effect on you or if there are severe side effects. And of course, the beauty of it is if you would do all these N of 1 trials and in the end would group them. You could have evidence at the group level but also at the individual level simultaneously. That's of course our dream that we treat all of you with N of 1 trials and then still combine them into a group effort. Um, but of course there are limitations, it takes time, money, logistics and sometimes some ethical board reviews or at least some discussion about is this research or is it just formalization of clinical care. So this is it's a difficult discussion. Um, just as an example, because we started doing these individual and one trials and Esther was here with me, maybe you can just quickly raise your hand. Uh, she came to our outpatient clinic actually telling us that she has hyper PP. And of course we were uh, at first well, we thought, well, maybe we know better. We said, well, oh, probably a high PP. We did some other testing, and we even did a muscle biopsy. Not myself, but you can already see where this is going. And then afterwards, she came in with an attack, and luckily some uh, colleagues of mine did genetic testing for periodic paralysis, but she came in uh, at one of these visits and told us um, that she was having an attack. And that's the nice thing of people coming in with a text that well, gives us the opportunity to uh, do potassium measurements in blood and if you find a high potassium or low potassium then of course your diagnosis is well straight up, especially if you also have a sodium channel opportunity mutation. Which you have. Um, and we also did needle EMG because from this hyper PP we have heard before that there's a strong correlation with myotonia in symptoms but also in electrical myotonia with needle EMG. And we also found some myotonic discharges that you can see here. And again, this should be normal, this image when you stick a needle in a healthy muscle, this should be a straight line without any noise. And even uh, the long exercise test was positive, so we had this nice image of hyper-PP and then we ask ourselves, well, what do we know of hyper-PP and should we treat it in which, which way? So we first asked Esther to, uh, to keep a diary of the first baseline data of two months and um, she told us that distribution of weakness is especially in the legs and that common triggers are really in line with hyper-PP literature, especially no breakfast, fasting state, Emotional stress, cold, alcohol, so these are actually exactly the triggers that we found from the hyper PP survey, especially in the morning. And the frequency was, well, around one attack a day, lasting 41 minutes with a severity of two. And I should explain this DDS severity scale because that's the Guillain Barre syndrome severity scale. It's a totally different disease, but this is the outcome measure that was also used in the Tawil trial and the other trials in periodic paralysis, meaning zero is almost no complaints, two is you need assistance with a stick, three from someone else, four is lying down in bed with uh, not being able to stand up on your own, and five is 
going to an ICU or to an emergency room department. And so we, we had this baseline data and we thought, well, we've read the articles on the group effect of periodic paralysis. So there are these trials on salbutamol aerosols as a tech prevention or a tech uh, treatment. And we have the acetazolamide and diclofenamide trials. So we thought, well, maybe first try the salbutamol. But instead of just giving Esther the salbutamol and letting her come back after three months, saying, well, did it help? I'm not sure. Let's go on. Uh, we thought, well, maybe we, this is a good opportunity to do an end of one trial. Uh, so that's what we did. We um, were asked her to uh, join in an end of one trial with treatment periods of two weeks, uh, four in total, with possible extension to six. And we asked her to keep this attack diary on frequency, duration, and severity of the attacks. And um, our pharmacist made these sort of more aerosols placebo and the real ones, and we gave the similar instruction in this large group trial that was done before on IPPP, and it is that she should take salbutamol treatment at the start of an attack, two of these inhalants, um, and after 15, 30, and 45 minutes, and of course the same was for the placebo, but both of us did not know which one was placebo and which one was the real salbutamol. Um, so that looked like this with one, two, three, four on it and greatly labeled so that no one knew which was the real one and which was the placebo. Um, and let me just quickly uh, talk about the results you see here. These are the four two weeks periods uh, with period one and period four afterwards after deep blinding being the real periods with the active salbutamol, period two and period three with the placebo period. So you can already see that salbutamol is an attack treatment and not a frequency treatment, not prophylactic, um, because the number of attacks in these two, two weeks are well, in line uh, to 12, 11, 11, 11. So that's good for us for the end of one trial, the goal of the end of one trial. And if we then look at the attack severity and the attack duration, um, and then the attack duration is in minutes, and the attack severity is the scale um, that I explained earlier. So five is being at an ICU emergency department, and zero being no complaints at all, and one and two being somewhere that you need a system to get up, walk. Uh, and if you take a look at these data over the periods, there seems to be not that much of an effect. I think you do agree with me on that. And um, even so, if you take a look at, for example, um, the attack severity seems to be in period four higher than in period three. So the active component seems to maybe even do less well than the placebo, so that's the opposite of what you would really like. And if you then do some rough statistics on it, and you combine these placebo periods and the salbutamol ventolin periods, you really see that actually the ventolin is not working because there's a mean attack duration of well, around an hour versus the 48 minutes, and also the severity is in line. Um, and if we then do some more significant testing on the statistical level, uh, we can really say that this is not working, so not a significant treatment. Uh, but then we thought, well, but this group level treatment or this group trial showing that this salbutamol is working out for hyperpp should be true in any way, right? So maybe we can try to get this physiological uh, response. Uh, that's why we did this long exercise test again. Uh, and you can see here, this is the normal value without treatment. So that's actually the diagnostic long exercise test. And um, that shows a positive result because you get this CMAP decline uh, below your normal values that are in red. And we asked Esther to come back twice more to do repeated CMAP exercise testing. And the first time we ask her to do these inhalations of the real salbutamol. This is the light blue line. Here. Of course, these are just three goes. Uh, but still, you can see that 
during these Soviet and World War era zones, what you are staking in the truck, as also in the end of one trial, that there is a normalization of the scene map. So it does not, um, but it does not decline under your normal values. And then we ask her to do the same, but then with a tablet of Soviet and World one hour before the test, and we see again a physiological effect. So what did we conclude from this trial? The solitomol aerosol attack uh, treatment does not decrease attack frequency or duration um, or severity, actually you should say severity or duration in the test of patients. So this treatment was discontinued and um, we started Diamox as a preventive treatment. But there is this physiological effect. So then it's interesting to see that you can still have a physiological effect on the muscle side. But of course, what it's all about is a minimal clinical important difference. So you want a difference of a treatment that you register in your own life. So you, it's in the same discussion as we had before. What is the amount of gain of quality of life or activities that you want to have before you start a treatment? And this is obviously not enough. Um, so I'm happy to announce that Esther is now involved in a research project on the long exercise test because we're very curious about this physiological effect and if you can really use the long exercise also to correlate your individual treatment. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask 10 periodic paralysis patients to come in and do repeated long exercise testing. So four times um, in total, two on the left, two on the right arm and then try to see, well this is just an example of how this figure might look, but we want to know whether you have similar results and of, if these people that do have periodic paralysis but show a negative result on the CMAP, if they are four times negative or maybe two times in response, so it would be very interesting to present these data in two years, we hope, and then Esther might come over to um, We were also very lucky um, to diagnose three other patients with similar yeah. mutation. Stop maar. Just a half a year of the knee by the maker that should do the baby. This was also a very yeah. interesting story because this family came yeah. in yeah. saying that they had this chloride channelopathy yeah. yeah. and that family members were tested with a positive chloride channelopathy. And then we thought, well, we might expect yeah. a lot of myotonia, but the hallmark feature was not myotonia, but yeah. weakness. <coughs> Het helpt wel, hè? Ja. Zeker. Oké, dan kun je op één been staan. Attack of weakness. Ja, het liefst is ondersteun. Oké. Okay. And again, we did uh, potassium testing and long exercise test, and potassium did not change. So for now, we diagnosed him with normal uh, kalemic periodic paralysis, but we know that these patients could still be hyper or normal. Um, but we're planning to do similar experiments with Salbutamol and Diamox in these two brothers, because it's a twin. Um, let me just quickly touch base on the preliminary results and then um, give you some closure of this day, because it's been a long day. Um, we also are involved in this combined and one trials, or we performed this combined and one trials in the past uh, two years. Um, and it was on Nexertin uh, compared to placebo. And uh, as Yaya already told, there was this great trial from uh, people in Rochester and London and Kansas and Texas, Texas too. <laughs> <laughs> France, probably. <laughs> I thought you were in Rochester at the time. Yeah. I was Texas. You were in Texas. Well, this was a great trial of Triumph. Um, and that was also. The headings were trial trying for rare disease network, and of course, it's great to have such a big trial with uh, how many patients were 52 or 50? 52, right? And you can see here the um, well, the main figure sort of showing the main outcome measure was uh, stiffness on the severity scale from nine to from zero to ten, and ten being most severely stiffness is ever experienced, and zero no stiffness. And you see there's the Big significant treatment results between the mexicotine and the placebo uh, treatment of around 
about two, three points on this scale from zero to ten, so that's a really big difference. It's significant and um, complements to that, but of course, for you as individual patients, you still want to know, am I that good responder? And do I show the similar effect as the group, or am I probably, or even could I be the bad responder? So that's still the problem, and again, this doctor comes up asking questions about can we assess both individual and population outcomes uh, simultaneously and can we maybe even integrate the previous research such as this big trial and combine this with new evidence and then the answer is yes we can and we've done this using combined and contrast. Um, so we wanted to do this to be a second trial of Nexotetus placebo in these non trophic myotonia patients but to also see if this N of 1 trials, individual trials, and then the combinement afterwards could really help and be an innovative trial design for rare diseases. Uh, so it was a unique opportunity for us to compare our results with uh, the ones from this large trial. And what we did is we uh, included 30 non trophic myotonia patients and gave them the similar drug regimen as the, in the Mexican team trials. So three times daily, 200 milligrams, and we use similar outcome measures. And again, these outcome measures are uh, questionnaires, clinical myotonic tests, but also objective measurements of needle EMG myotonic runs, um, but also more or less force profiles. Um, so these 30 patients underwent these treatment blocks, and afterwards, after one treatment of four weeks of active medication and four weeks of placebo, we sat together with the statistician and asked ourselves, is there enough evidence for effectiveness already, or is there enough evidence for ineffectiveness? So in short, is the drug working, or is it not working? And if you could really say that it's not working, or it is working, then that would, that would be the end of the individual n one trial. And if you're still in doubt, you would engage in another so a second set, up to four sets, and we did this in 30 patients, and then afterwards combined the data to have individual evidence of the treatment, but also group evidence. Um, and what we asked is also clinical experts that were already engaged in the previous trial, such as Yaya, so afterwards you should close your eyes and close your ears because you still need to give some judgment about the trial. Um, so to combine these judgments from experts with actual trial data to get this probability that this treatment is really working at the individual level. Um, maybe this is the time you close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because we have some preliminary data, and, uh, I'm just showing you the, some of the first patients, but at this moment we have all 30 patients analyzed. But the average treatment effect of these stiffness, so the myotonic stiffness, the real big complaint of this patient, on the 0 to 10 scale, you can see that individually these patients show big effects of the maximum team. So it's really more or less a miracle treatment for most of the patients, really life saving and life changing. So it can go up to 5 points in the 0 to 10, so that's spectacular. Um, and this gives us posterior probabilities that the treatment is working for the individual of around 100%. And it's not so difficult to see because if I was blinded to the treatment, but patients would come up running towards me and standing on chairs and being so excited that they finally found this treatment. Um, so of the 30 patients, uh, two were non-responders, only two. One dropped out to an allergic reaction of the skin and one dropped out with no specific reason. And if you then do this group analysis, and red here are the sodium channelopathy patients with my non stop myotonia, and the black line are the chloride, and you can see here that the average difference in stiffness, so the treatment effect on the chloride group was around 4, and in the uh, sodium group was around uh, about a 2. So it's a big effect if you're having this 0 to 10 scale with a big significant difference. Um, of course, we talked about the adverse effects of mexalatine. Luckily, we had no patients with uh, cardiac arrhythmia or with other EKG changes, but what we did find was a lot of 
gastrointestinal discomfort, so diarrhea, stomach pain, some headache, some tremor, uh, insomnia, but nothing severe, and all patients were happy to continue treatment after trial. Uh, so in conclusion of these combined level 1 trials, uh, preliminary results are in line with the conducted RCT. It stands for Randomized Controlled Trial, so the first trial from this multi-center. Mexilatine seems to be effective and safe for non-dystrophic myotonia. These combined N of 1 trials with Bayesian approach are easy to incorporate into clinical practice and uh, Mexilatine is now in the Netherlands reimbursed for all non-dystrophic myotonia myotonia patients after this trial, so it's a big success for us too. Um, so let's get you started on these NF1 trials. Um, I gave you some examples on how NF1 trials could work if you're having doubts about your treatment, if you want to try something new and you're not really included in the trial, you can still ask your physician to think with you on the following NF1 trials. I think the basis is having a good diary, and this one is in Dutch, but I would be happy to translate it into English. Or if you're uh, interested in learning Dutch, you are happy to learn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it would be nice to just have some data, and probably also for yourself to <coughs> such an attack diary to see whether um, well, just changes in meals or medication, if you can find a pattern, and afterwards you can use it for an end of one trial. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and we'll be happy to take your question after this small video clip that I still would like to show you. Um, this work was all done in collaboration with a lot of people from our own university. I would especially also like to thank Esther for her cooperation in this NF1 trial. It's not easy for a patient to uh, do an NF1 trial because you're so busy with like, registering all your attacks. So. I'm very grateful that she did this NF1 trial together with me to get a feeling of if this could work for periodic paralysis. And I think the answer is yes. So Esther, I thank you very much. And also all our collaborators uh, from abroad and especially all patients with skeletal muscle channelopathies like you guys and patients with non dystrophic myotonia because uh, I certainly learn a lot and we hope to well, to close or bridge this gap that is between the lab and the patient care together with you. And I just want to uh, finally show this image clip of one of the trial patients that received mexilatine and had these very severe warm-up phenomena and after the mexilatine treatment for the first time in his life was able to run down the corridors. So I think this is something that we achieved already with non of myotonia, but the goal would be to come here back in 20 years or 10 years and not see all these beds with pillows at the round of the, the room that just have you more active without falling down during talks but with good treatments that really help reduce attacks.
probably got better with sugar and therefore it looked like there was no effect, but there were actually two effects, one in each direction in different clusters. Uh, does your design allow you to pick out stuff like that? Yeah, we could, I, I don't know the ins and outs of this analysis, but I know that we're doing this hierarchical Bayesian approach. So I mean that we can uh, look at effects from subdivisions. So what we're looking at is sodium versus uh, chloride and female versus male. Uh, age is a factor. So we, we can do this hierarchical analysis. But can you can you um, can you self-associate clusters and say, look, here's a bunch, half of them get much better, half of them get much worse, and there's fewer than expected people who are showing no change. Can you pick out that without knowing the factors in advance? I guess so, because these Bayesian analysis are famous for these network analysis that they also use in neuroscience. So I'm not completely sure about this one of the big advantages of Bayesian approach instead of frequentist. More questions? I'm sorry? Okay. Um, this is not direct. Um, this is not directly related to your talk, but to several of the talks we've had today. I hope that's okay. Yeah. And I may not just be asking you, I may be asking all of you. Um, how much is it considered common for um, hypokalemic periodic paralysis patients to have warm-up phenomenon after they've been inactive? Um, because I don't know, um, my mutation is not identified and um, after I've been sitting still, which I try not to do, it, I'm really, I look exactly like all the things we've seen today. Yeah. And it, and then it gets better. Like by the time I've walked down to the toilet, I'm not limping. Uh, I don't know, is that yeah. common? Well, I think it's difficult because if you're like in periodic paralysis, one of the features is that you get this proximal myopathy, so weakness of your upper mm -hmm. legs and upper arms. And this could also show a similar pattern um, by just standing up from the chair could also look more or less stiff like in myotonia. So you should really, um, well, you should know whether it's really stiffness or it's weakness. But if you're saying it's not, it's really stiffness and not weakness. Well, I'm not aware of periodic paralysis patients having this stiffness, but I'm not sure what's your opinion. Or, or periodic paralysis with warm up phenomena. I mean, but you also have to question the diagnosis, obviously. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you heard that someone came into your clinic with saying one thing and then of another thing another, I mean, and it may be a unique new variant too, I mean, we've certainly found those over the years, so a little bit tricky to say. Well, it is actually the same as these uh, two young boys, which I showed one of the video clips from, because they came in saying they had, they had this chloride channelopathy, and then we thought, well, this weakness that they're talking about is probably the transient paralysis that we see these chloride channelopathies, but in the end, it was not the transient paralysis, it was just weakness from hypopathy, so it's always difficult to... I would like to um, move on to the last speaker of the day. Uh, Steve, you're up again, right? Yes. <laughs> do, do you, have, you have something? Yes. Uh, this was on the agenda as an open question and answer. Oh, really? that what it was? That, is that, uh, is that what it was? <laughs> so we made it. You made up the agenda. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, if you have any questions, 
Um, we can open it up to anything that happens today for the next 15 minutes, and uh, maybe we'll entertain some internet stuff. So, uh. oh. <coughs> okay. I guess this is the whoever wants to answer kind of question, but um, I have the SCN 4A mutation, and we still have the trial. But I see sometimes descriptions of SCN 4A and myotonia, and I don't really feel like you know, I have myotonia first now that I look at it. I'm like, do I? I just don't know what's doing. But and if it doesn't seem, and then there was the uh, person that had the normal you know, PD and then hyper. So it seems like even in that gene, there are multiple conditions. So I mean, is that something that you find that you know, even though you've got that genetic type, you may not know exactly where you fall? Because I'm hyper, but I my testing is low because of my dietary management. So I can uh, talk to that because uh, we really haven't mentioned it uh, so far. Uh, in the realm between hyperkalemic periodic paralysis and paramyotonia congenita, there is tremendous overlap. So within the same family, there's some affected members who have more of a hyperkalemic periodic paralysis phenotype, where episodes of weakness triggered by mass congestion associated with high potassium levels is the predominant symptom. Others have stiffness that paradoxically gets worse with repeated effort or with cold temperatures in the same family with the same mutation. So there are those challenges which make the so-called genotype, phenotype, you know, what mutation do you have, what are your symptoms, correlation, difficult. And I think it just speaks to the fact of how complex this system is. And there's going to be some variability. And in the hyper PP PMC realm, I think that's where that variability is at its greatest. So I certainly wouldn't use the presence or absence of clinical features to be exclusionary uh, or say someone doesn't have this condition. And I think we're still filling it out. I have an Excel spreadsheet and every time I hear from somebody or I see another paper, I add it in there because it's amazing the variability you can get. And I want to specifically talk about your comment on the potassium change. Because uh, Dr. Trevetti hinted at it a, a bit uh, when she said that it's easier to detect if somebody has an abnormally low potassium than a high potassium. And part of the reason there is a technical one. There are a lot of potential artifacts that can happen to make the potassium in the blood test look high. So if they have difficulty sticking you with the needle, or the tourniquet's on too long. All these things can make the potassium high so you could miss a low level, or you could artificially have what appears to be a high level. So there aren't similar challenges that make the potassium too low, uh, failing some machine malfunction, but you know, something that's happening at the bedside. So I would submit, and I think Dr. Turetti might agree, that a low potassium always has great interpretive value, but high or normal is not sure. I'm not, you know, I like the idea that some of these um, phenotypes are described as dyskalemic because the potassium sometimes goes in either way or they can change. And it's, it's really a moving target. There's a tremendous delay between when your symptoms are at their maximal and when you can finally get to the triage nurse and get signed, get the blood drawn and have it come back. And things uh, could change now uh, by that time. And there could be tremendous differences between what's at the local tissue level and what's detectable. So I think the, the jury is open there. And, and as we're doing, uh, even some of the studies I showed you today with those mouse studies, with the simulated exercise, with acidosis, the potassium is constant throughout that. So here you can see there are other factors that feed into the whole picture that can trigger an attack with a rock solid potassium that we're clamping to be fixed during that experiment. This is Selena. Some patients would have just pure hyper-PP, while some would have the hyper-PP and the PMC, different mutations. And I can't remember your situation particularly, but needle EMG 
presence of melatonin should be very easy to find, very, very easy to find. And that will help you understand the phenotype, the presentation better. Yeah, I remember when I was looking at that, I was 16, 16 years ago when I was in Disney. Yeah. Um, and I remember that sound, that sound they played. So I'm guessing maybe there was some, and I just... I don't think I did the EMG, right? It just came to me genetically confirmed. Yeah. Right, yeah, we didn't do it as part of the trial, but this was when I was, before I was even diagnosed, and that sounded familiar. But I, maybe I just don't have it so much, and I'm overpronouncing. But I and, think it's very And like Dr. Cannon said, it's very variable. For a given patient also, from one time to the other time. Um, oh, my God. That's right. Oh. <laughs> Good question. Um, do you find, or have you heard from patients about talked to a few people here over the last couple of days uh, who, like me, over a period of 15, 20 years, their symptoms started out one way and they kind of evolved over a period of time. Yes. But no genetic diagnosis. So, but we run in families. I mean, my father had what I have. Um, so, do you, do you see a lot of that? So I see um, patients with various neurological disorders, not simply periodic paralysis, where the manifestations in chronic diseases can evolve, can change over time. And I don't think we know so much about periodic paralysis because we don't have natural history studies in periodic paralysis. Because you don't see progression from one year to two years, from one year to 10 years, to 15 years, 20 years. We do know that patients can develop progressive and permanent weakness. But if we had natural history studies, we would have a better idea as to what the course is. So it would be more easy for us to predict and tell patients. The dilemma comes up because it are, as we all grow older, we develop other medical conditions too. And do those confound the original illness? Plus, many neurological illnesses, and I won't be surprised with periodic paralysis too, that symptoms can progress and evolve over time. What may happen initially in teenage years, I've heard patients say that I still have classic episodes so and so, but now my episodes don't get triggered, but the same is different now. And perhaps Dr. Levin will also have more, you know, you've had this disease so many years. Have you found an evolution uh, I in think terms of changing? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, but, you know, it's tricky because as you, as you live, you manage it better, you hope. And uh, so, I guess... You know, maybe you get less severe anxiety. I think that's going to be variable from person to person. Okay, exactly. Yeah, that's going to be tricky. Don't run to it. <laughs> okay, so yes, I have, to answer your question, I've noticed a progression. It started out with the tanking and have that first, and then it went into the melting. I call it the melting of an attack. Um, not because I'm a yoga instructor, but I wanted to plug yoga. Um, it has helped me a lot. Uh, the mental aspect of this, the emotional aspect of this has been very challenging. So yoga has helped a lot, and that might be something to look into as, long, um, as well as acupuncture. Getting my liver and kidney function strong has helped a lot. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, or it might be worth looking into for the docs in the room, um, the link to eating disorders, and dieting. I've noticed that a lot with myself um, from having a disorder back in college, and that's when my symptoms started. Um, doing much better now with that, but I've noticed that that really correlated, you know, brought on a lot of stuff there. So that might be something to look into for the population. And again, kind of to talk about the, I don't know if I'm hypo or hyper, if anybody can help me with that, um, I'll love you forever, but um, it's not in my family. So, and I mentioned it's been tested. So, um, the other the other connection I think would be really helpful for, for women in particular is the hormonal connection. Um, I know the week before my cycle, I'm, I'm a mess. So, and when I was pregnant, I was better. And I spoke to a woman recently. She had high estrogen. She has high estrogen, and when she was pregnant, she was worse. I had high testosterone. When I was pregnant, I was better. I don't know if that'll help you guys figure something out, but there may be a connection there that may help in the future. Thanks, very good, very good points. Thank you. I have a couple of questions about paramyotonia. Um, I'm wondering if 
paramyotonia is harder to catch on an EMG. Um, when I've gone, it's um, been provoked as opposed to just being there. Um, so do you have to be in, I guess, an attack of paramyotonia for it to show up on an EMG? And the other question I have is about the variances for myotonia and paramyotonia. Um, for the speed of, I guess, what would be the warm-up phenomenon and that compared to when paramyotonia kicks in. I noticed we saw a couple, few examples of the myotonia fist and it seemed to happen quite fast, the warm-up effect. And I have the fist and then when I move my hand, it stiffens over time, but it seems to take longer than the warm-up effect did? Is that just a variance from person to person, or is that part of paramyotonia that it takes longer? I'm not sure if that question makes sense. I didn't have it written down. <laughs> okay, so I'll answer the first part of your question, which is about the EMG part. And when we did the natural history study in patients with myotonia congenita and paramyotonia congenita, we found beautiful, very clear myotonia, and we checked five muscles. In all the patients, we check the arm, upper area, that's the deltoid muscle. We check the hand muscle, thigh, leg, the shin area, and the mid-back. <laughs> and the purpose was to do these five areas in all patients to see if there's a particular pattern. Like, you know, do you see myotonia more in one area compared to the other area? But there was really nice myotonia on the EMG demonstrated in all five spaces, whether it's myotonic congenita or paramyotonic congenita. So the beauty of non-dystrophic myotonia is much easier to diagnose, even though patient's symptoms may be mistaken for something else by many physicians. But when you stick a needle in the muscles, you can certainly get the myotonia. Your one other question about the EMG was, can, you, can people do something to induce the myotonia? So what is described in paramyotonia particularly is that cold makes it worse. So when we have somebody with paramyotonia, we can do needle EMG and look for the myotonia. Sometimes, in clinical research studies, you will dump the patient's hand in cold water, and the water is 20 degrees centigrade. And you can see responses on the nerve conduction, the C-map, the amplitude response can drop big time. And that's a typical feature of paramyotonia. So that's a challenging test to demonstrate further evidence of paramyotonia. Similarly, there is something called a short exercise test. So what we talked about all this while, in periodic paralysis, is a prolonged exercise test. This is a short exercise test where you exercise only for 10 seconds and you stim, 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 stim for one minute. And you do the whole set three times. And there's a particular pattern you can see in paramyotonia. So there are various things you can do on nerve conduction studies and EMG to look for evidence for paramyotonia. But the bottom line is if you stick a needle in his muscles, you'll find clear evidence of myotonia. And then Dr. Kans can ask the second question. So, with, also with regard to the timing of, of warm-up and paradoxical myotonia, uh, it can vary, um, but what we saw in the videos today is, is what I'm familiar with for the warm-up phenomenon. And Christoph mentioned some ideas about sodium channel inactivation. I think there are other possible explanations, accumulation of potassium and T2 and some things. But I wanted to point out that very curiously, there is no explanation for paramyotonic stiffness yet that I'm aware of, where activity should provoke the situation and make the myotonia progressively worse. I think it's a wide open question, uh, and the reason why that's important in considering is there might be a treatment strategy there that we just aren't clued into yet because we don't understand why you should have the phenomenon that's completely up the opposite of the warm-up phenomenon. And if we knew that, I think we'd have better ways to approach that. Just wanted to go back to your comment about uh, pregnancy and menstrual cycles. You know, there's uh, obviously big impact of uh, the endocrine hormonal axis on certainly hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So if you think about the fact that while there might be some differences in the room, and I'd be curious to learn about those, that the traditional thinking is hyperkalemic periodic paralysis becomes symptomatic at an earlier age, often in infancy, whereas hypokalemic, many times it's later, oftentimes coinciding with puberty. And for hypokalemic, particularly the most common R528H mutation, which was 60 out of 114 in the Netherlands, 
the women do not have the episodic attacks as frequently as the men do, even with it. So there's definitely a hormonal thing. And in our female mice, they were resistant to potassium and these attacks. So there's a big story there, and we don't understand that connection yet at all. Um, with all the hospitalizations that I've had the last four years, no. <laughs> <laughs> the speakers are the same no matter where you're from. So. Yeah. Most of uh, the episodes would start in my legs or my arms, and then I would be in such a high level of pain that it would travel and eventually end up in my respiratory system. Now, since spring or winter, um, it'll go straight to my respiratory system. Um, whether or not you know, the rest of my body is paralyzed, just attacking the respiratory system, and I can't breathe, and then that's when we call 901, and then it's been more serious with the patients. Why would that be? Why would it go from always seeing my legs or arms first? It's kind of a slower process to just right to the respiratory. And, and yours is a hypokinetic thing? I have paramyotonia congenita. Okay. So, uh, in paramyotonic congenita, usually the more severe or more troublesome phenomenon is the myotonic stiffness, and it often comes in the hands and the eyelids and the tongue. Dr. Louis Tachek loves to say how when he has a suspected individual who might have this coming to his office, he goes and gets a milkshake, has him drink the milkshake, and then their voice gets all thick and slurred from the tongue myotonia that's cold sensitive. The reason I went into that digression is there's a very clear explanation for regional muscle differences. The more distal muscles where your body temperature is cooler are more commonly affected in paramyotonia congenita. That kind of makes sense from the science. We have to be mindful of patient reporting and your experience. I mean, when you say the legs, it's a proximal legs, that's kind of the opposite pattern. Clearly it can happen, you experience it. I think the fact that different muscles are affected uh, can depend on level of activity. We see so much, and we've heard many times, if you're going to do a clinical provocative test with the uh, CMAP exercise test, or you're going to look for myotonia, uh, or time, how quickly somebody can get up out of a chair or walk up the stairs, so much of it depends on recent level of activation of the muscles. I can, I can see where that would fluctuate, and again, things uh, change over time. I'm not aware of a natural history, and Dr. Trevetti mentioned how absence of data we have to struggle with that, where you would expect paramyotonia congenita to have the type of long-term progression that you're describing. Well, that's true. I mean, we try to attempt that in a natural history study, but it was very difficult because in two, three years, that's how long a natural history study was in paramyotonia myotonia. In two, three years, it was very hard for us to capture any significant differences. So the answer is, we don't have an answer for that. Like, you know, the question remains unanswered, basically. We don't understand. There's a lot of fluctuation. We know environmental triggers, infection, stress, electro electrolyte imbalances, certain foods. We know all those things play some role in these channelopathies. And so every individual is different. So I don't understand the theory the reason why it's changing our situation. But we know cold can be worse in paramedical. A couple more questions and then I think we, it's time to call it a day. Um, I'm here because of my daughter who's, well she'll be 13 this week. Um, because she's pediatric, I'm more limited, oh sorry, I'm more limited in the number of doctors available to see her. We've worn out all the doctors in three cities that are pediatric neurology, rheumatology, and uh, uh, I don't remember the other one. And so now she's stuck with me. And um, I, I believe it's hypokalemia because it's uh, stereo, what is it, corticosteroids uh, or dehydration that caused her to go into episodes. So I believe it's potassium dropping. And giving her potassium helps her. I'm not giving her natural forms of potassium. I don't have anybody treating her. There's no doctors overseeing her care at this point. They've all just kind of thrown in their hands because they can't figure it out. Um, it does always start with pain in her abdomen and um, then tingling in whatever muscle groups going to be affected. Then it contracts 
and freezes. Now it's not. What I'm learning, I mean, this is my educational weekend. What I'm learning is she's unable to move, but she's not paralyzed. It's not considered paralysis because her muscles are relaxed. Uh, her muscles are frozen, but it's not myotonia. It's not just muscle weakness, and they're frozen for an extended period of time. Um, I don't even know where to go from here to try to figure out what's going on with her. I do think that possibly it has something to do with her pancreas, because that's where the pain is. And I found one thing that related to a 40-year-old man, I only can read the abstract. I can tell you what the journal is, though. Um, a 40-year-old man that presented with um, hypoclemic spontaneous paralysis, they called it. They didn't differentiate between muscle freezing or relaxing. And it was associated to uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. And I don't know if anybody else has anything relating to that, or if that's possible, or if you could even help me access the two-page journal article so I don't have to pay $32 to become a member of the journal to find it. But I don't know if anybody else has had any of that similar type of experience um, that can give me any direction as to where to go from that. I can certainly get you the journal article that just email, email me. <laughs> Um, I can understand your dilemma. It is uh, certainly not one of those patterns, the classic patterns, which you know most of us would say, yeah, we know, we agree to the diagnosis, even if the genetic testing is negative. It's an unusual presentation with abdominal pain, tingling, and um, did you say freezing or stiffness? You mentioned something. Well, they contract and freeze. Contract and freeze. And she can't move for hours to days. And the muscle warm up, if she warms up the muscles, they come back out. So yeah, unfortunate for a 13 year old to go through that. But uh, you were asking uh, one particular thing was about the pancreas. And pancreatic disease causes pain in the back, not typically in the front. So that oh, would, okay. Well, that is I'm right. So I understand why your question came up. But pancreatic disorders, because the pancreas is the back portion of the abdomen, so people with pancreatic problems will have back pain rather than the front pain. So perhaps that will take you away from the pancreatic um, concern. As to your other part, the diabetic ketoacidosis and having an attack, I think Dr. Cannon has talked about how acidosis, how electrolyte imbalances and hyperosmolality or dehydration, which can be seen in DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, can certainly precipitate attacks. Um, as for your daughter, if she's had any testing during a spell, that perhaps would be helpful. Like when she's having a spell, she's seen in the emergency room or a medical facility getting potassium tested, getting her EKG tested. Calcium levels. They, they, won't do it. they won't even put her on a heart monitor now. They consider her, because a number of neurologists are saying she's psychosomatic, so when we go into the ER, they will do nothing. It's very really unfortunate because, uh, I mean, we don't know everything, and we always are the first ones to admit that, yes, there is everything in neurology is not black and white. And we can test for things that we have the capability of the testing. But for somebody who has abdominal pain, tingling, there are various kinds of neurological disorders or non-neurological that come to mind. One of them, of course, we think of here, here because of the question of periodic paralysis. But I don't want to give you medical diagnoses without having right. seen your different right. things like porphyria can cause abdominal pain, tingling symptoms. Those are episodic symptoms of weakness and numbness that come on and patient can have abdominal pain. And that can happen to young people as a genetic disorder then people can have intra-abdominal other conditions that can cause pain. When people have pain, they get contracted. And if you hyperventilate, you get tingling also. So there are other things to explore. Then there's other disorders called stiff person syndrome where people get tightness and contractions and they get just stiffness all over. And those are immune-mediated disorders. So there are a few disorders I can think of, and I may be totally off here because I don't treat pediatric patients. So the spectrum of pediatric neurological disorders is more than what I'm used to. But there are certain other things to be evaluated for during a spell. So um, if there's more concern for periodic paralysis, then you would chase prolonged exercise testing to look at that furthermore. Yeah, I, yeah. I, just have other yeah, no, I, I think that uh, my general strategy, just as recommendations when people, you know, write into PPA, ask the experts, you know, I need a diagnosis. I think there's certain low-hanging fruit that we know, there's certain, there's like a certain standard battery of tests, honestly, that you could order to rule in or out either paramyotonia congenita or myotonia congenita or hypoperiodic ATS, yada yada. And, and you know, so, so once, once those things get ruled out, genetic testing gets ruled out, uh, you start to get in this very gray zone of, 
you, you're, you're not a here nor there, you're a unique case, and you're, I don't want to say you're on your own, we're here, you know, but it, it's going to be very difficult to get answers, but you do want to definitely make sure that you hit all those low-hanging fruit tests before you just abandon, you know, a diagnosis, and, and, and once, once it's not periodic paralysis, it kind of falls outside the scope of the PPA, and so it's, it's tricky for us, to, once it's not periodic paralysis, it's a little hard uh, to say what it is, but it, you know, sometimes the value of this association is to really rule out that it's periodic paralysis, and oh, I was on the wrong road, and a, a couple of bo folks have come here and ended up with Barter syndrome or some seizure disorder or something, episodic ataxia, and it's been very helpful for them to do that. So, I mean, you know, we are always searching for a, a, an answer, and the reason why most of us are here is because we have things that seem like periodic paralysis, and so we're, that's the easiest, or the most sensible thing to latch on to, but, you know, so I, I guess we just hit the low-hanging fruit, and then, then it's a question of having a physician who has an open mind, and it ends up oftentimes being empiric trial and error. You know, doctors love, because it's medical legal, you know, I have a diagnosis, in the literature, the classically, the textbook says, if you have diagnosis X, treat with Y. That's so nice for me and the lawyers, you know? Uh, when I don't know what I'm treating and I'm giving something, the default in the US society is first do no harm. So if you say, oh, my daughter has a really bad disease, I can, as a physician, say, listen, you know what? It's not for me. I can't help you. That protects me. If I say, hey, you know what? I'm going to try to help you. And I screw up and you sue me, then I'm done. I can't treat any more patients. And so the, the way that the US legal system is in medicine favors, unfortunately, having doctors be like, oh, I don't, I'm not going there. I'm not even going to let you come to my office. I'm not a specialist. Go see the guy down the street. And that's why people are going from city to city to city. And it's something that, you know, honestly, we could, should talk to our congressman about as a whole different thing than we're I'm prepared to deal with here. But I think that's a big problem with, that a lot of us encounter. <coughs> If you think it's pancreatic tissue and it's in the front, sometimes there's something called a diverticulum, and it can be pancreatic tissue that ends up in the small intestine. So I can't make any other. You, you, you can comment. Yeah, no, I can. Okay. So sometimes there's pancreatic tissue that develops in abnormal places, so it's not in the pancreas anymore. So if they think it's like a pancreas, except it's not in the back. There's something called a diverticulum that can that'll be in the small intestine and it can register as uh, as pancreatic tissue. It actually is pancreatic tissue, but it's located in the small intestine. And so that that can be a connection point of the location and the type of tissue. It's called diverticulum. There are other types of there are other kinds of things that are diverticular which are other abnormalities in the small intestine, so that not all of them are pancreatic tissue. That's just one example of something that might explain why it's in the wrong place. Okay, guys, well, I think that, um, I, I apologize, it's 5.15, so um, maybe have your question privately. Uh, we should wrap up, and 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 we 